Oh, hello. Many Magic the Gathering players ask the question, how do I evaluate my Magic the Gathering cards? How do I determine if this is a card of the correct power level or is correct for the meta? What are the factors that I look at? How do we make these choices and evaluations? I think it's one of the most difficult things in Magic, but also one of the most important. And so I have brought in here with me today, the man himself, John Roberts or J-Dubs, if you follow him on Twitch, which I I highly recommend that you do. Uh, John, thank you so much for being here. It's nice to be here. For those of you who are not familiar, uh, John actually finished number one ranked for Constructed in Arena for both October of 2019 and January of 2020, but he's actually more well known for his wild deck brews, and that's how I first came across him, are some of these uh, really fun, really cool decks. So if you're someone like me who is a little more than sick of the same meta decks that keep getting posted around, you should definitely go check out a lot of the brews that John puts together. I'll, of course, link all of this in the description. But today, John's come here to talk about card evaluation, which, as I said, is one of the most important, but also one of the less understood aspects of the game. John, why don't we just start out by defining it? What do we mean when we say that we're looking to evaluate our magic cards? What does that even mean? Well, uh, I'll tell you what it means. Uh, at least in, in my perspective, the card evaluation uh, is probably the, uh, like you said, the most uh, under, you know, probably the most underrated or least understood aspect of magic. Uh, but the way I evaluate them is going to be through, you know, cost. So, like, you know, what is this mana cost? What is the effect of the card? How many times can you use it? Also, what colors the card is in? You know, so it's like relative to what kind of decks it can actually go in. If something's like off color, you know, card effect is off color, maybe it's not going to work as well in a uh, particular style of deck. Black, you know, let's say a black card that draws cards is not going to work as well in like a like a blue deck, for example, because you probably have to sacrifice a creature mm -hmm. in order to do mm -hmm. so, right? So yeah, so something like that. Uh, but um, I, I do think that that card evaluation should probably be uh, higher on people's list as far as um, magic skills is concerned. Just because I feel that uh, that's what's going to help you be able to build better decks. Uh, once you uh, understand how a card, you know, works, uh, you know, like beyond the surface value, like, you know, let's say you look at a card uh, like, you know, like Fires of Invention. Uh, I mean, of course, it's banned now. But you know, let's say you look at that. Let's say you look at that card. Right. Uh, the first thing you would probably say is, "Oh, it's a four mana do nothing enchantment." You know, like it doesn't actually do anything. You have to have other cards to, for it to be good, right? Right. Uh, and it, you know, your opponent can actually remove it because it's an enchantment. But what it actually does is far greater than what you may think, considering it allows you to free up not only the mana that you play play down on. So like, let's say you play it on, four, on turn four, right? Play on turn four, and you immediately can play another four mana card mm -hmm. right after that. And then now your opponent has to answer the fires of invention and be able to play their game plan on top of that. But then you you just, you, you know, let's say they pay, they pay two mana for a return to nature to destroy it, right? Now they just spent two mana whenever you didn't have any mana cost at that point. Because you just played fires into another four drop. Uh, let's say you untap with it. Now you just explode. Right. And I think a lot of people were, were skeptical of that card just because of the fact that, yes, it, it can be destroyed. Not realizing the other uh, implications that it has on the game, like activating your um, activated abilities with the extra mana. I do think that like the effect a card has on the game itself, not just the effect of the card. Don't look at just the effect of the card. Look at the effect that it has on the game itself. For example, like Embercleave. Okay. Embercleave doesn't seem that great, right? Because you can just remove the creature or you can remove the Embercleave. But what does it, what, what does it do? It forces an, an opponent. Like just, just the fact that Embercleave is a card and your opponent swings at you, you don't want to block, right? Right. You don't want to block. Your opponent cannot even have it in their hand. 
but you don't want to block just because of the fact that that is a card you know like even if you have the answer for it now you have to keep leaving band up every single turn and your opponent's just sitting there like you know they're just getting advantage every single turn because you're leaving up two mana every turn while they're tapping out and just the, the effect that it has on the game itself even though the card is not really what you would think would be be great or at least at first when people when it first was released it wouldn't seem that great up, up front because oh you get plus one plus one double strike and trample and you have to attack with all you know pretty much all your creatures in order to reduce the cost of it but it's it's far beyond that it's 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 far beyond of what what the card actually offers it's it's forcing your opponent to play in a way that they don't want to actually play I especially like with Embercleave that it's a card that I don't even need to have in my hand for my opponent to be afraid of because they don't know whether it's in my hand. And so I'm swinging in and I can leave some mana open and they know it's in my deck somewhere. Maybe it's in my hand, maybe it's not, but they're gonna always have to play around the idea that I do have it in hand. And it can have, it's such a powerful card in the sense that I don't even have to have it for it to be having an effect on on my opponent right and and look at uh claim the firstborn for example uh i mean let's say you're, you're playing a sacrifice do you ever want to play a three mana cost or less creature against a sacrifice deck right probably not probably not you probably don't want to like ever because you know of claim the firstborn just the fact that your opponent is you know like afraid of it they can be trying to play around it while either you don't have it or they're forced to keep trying to play things into it. And either way, like, you know, let's say they are playing into it. You can just take their creature and then you just do what you need to do and, and, and win the game. Stuff like that, like, you know, any card that, that you're forced to try to play around is going to be one of those cards that are of high power level, even though it may not seem like it, it would be. If it's a card that you would you would not want your opponent to have, then it's a good card. Like that's actually a really good question like, <laughs> to ask when <laughs> determining just if uh, a, a base evaluation is just if my opponent had this in hand, how upset would I be at having to face it? That's but that's getting like an emotional reaction. You listed a second ago uh, this really cool criteria that you use when evaluating and you started with cost. I believe. So uh, if we are going for less of that emotional gut reaction and we mm -hmm. want to try and look at uh, uh, actual criteria, what's the cost criteria? So, because uh, not all costs are low. So right. uh, what are we looking at when it comes to cost then for evaluation? Uh, so, okay. So take, for example, a card that goes in aggro. Uh, mm -hmm. You want it to cost between one, two, and three mana mm -hmm. or, or free, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sure. But. A free is good. <laughs> Um, free is good uh anything for and higher uh it, it has to have a huge effect on the game like it, it has to otherwise you're spending four mana to do pretty much nothing uh mm -hmm. and if you're playing again if you're playing an aggro deck you have to be low to the ground let's say robber of the rich the fact that it costs two mana makes makes it a good card if it was three mana a card would not be playable the card would just be in, in the binder somewhere that's where robber of the, of the rich would be so mana cost is huge how many colored mana symbols are in the cost and which of those colors are they so like let's say you're playing a green deck like a ramp deck for example usually you want to avoid playing double costed non-green cards in a ramp deck because most of your ramp is going to be centered around the color green so like let's say something's like triple blue for example you don't want like let's say cavalier gales in your simic ramp deck you don't want to play that probably <laughs> just because it's the triple blue whereas if it was like green 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 with cavalier of thorns yeah of course you want to play that because most of your lanes are most of your mana sources are green and then in, in, in mono blue cavalier gales is far too slow for for a mono blue deck that's one reason why cavalier gales has just never been good in uh, anything other than fire is just because the card itself is not really that great that powerful whereas cavalier of flame it has an immediate impact on the board that can actually win the game game on like on the spot against your opponent that's going to be a much higher power level than say let's say something like cavalier gills yeah what impact does it have on the game and do, is it immediate is it you know incremental is it something that's going to force your opponent to have to answer right away if it does not provide any value right away and it, it's not a, a, a card that has to be answered right away then the power level is, is, is going to be pretty low it, it may it may be like a synergy based card that you have to find like a niche for other than that though like um you know, if you if you're able to answer, if you ever able to say yes, it, it provides value immediately. It has to be answered, and the mana cost is actually not not bad. Then that card is going to be high on the list as far as playability. That'll be like my main criteria to look at. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, after cost, it would have to be what is the effect of the card, the power toughness, the the, the, the ability to you know counter other cards in the meta game. So like let's say a card that's like a a, a three four. Let's say let's say thrashing Brontodon, for example. It checks off a lot of things on the list of what it needs to do in order to be a playable card. It destroys artifacts and enchantments. So artifacts and enchantments are, are huge, at least right now, in, in standard. It has four toughness, which survives a hasted spell, girl spellbreaker, uh Nissa lands. It survives a lot of things in mono red. So the four toughness right there, yeah, it's got the three power to be able to, to, to kill a lot of things as well. The fact that it's a three four that also has the activated ability to destroy an artifact enchantment, that card would be uh, you know, a great card, you know, as far as playability. Uh that that's something you gotta look for is like what what little things does a card have that can can uh put give it an edge in, in the metagame. And so you have to really know what that meta is, because right now what you just said to me is you can tell that this is a good card for the factors that there's a lot of artifacts and enchantments that you're probably going to be coming up against. If you're not aware of what's out there, then you aren't able to recognize how good that is, knowing that the toughness is at such a level that the majority of uh, aggro cards like the Gruul Spellbreaker and such that you mentioned are are not going to be able to punch through it having that knowledge of what you're likely to encounter is critical in evaluating these cards it sounds like yeah like uh like another thing uh, to look at too is um like what kind of drawbacks it may have like something like let's say like assassin's trophy uh mm-hmm. that card has been non-existent in standard uh uh yeah. because of the drawback of the yeah, you know, giving your opponent a land essentially. So, you know, a- assuming that they have basic lands in the deck, of course. But uh, the fact that your opponent can actually search a de- search a deck for a land in standard, uh, that's a n- big no go. <laughs> it's like I don't care what permanent your opponent has on the board. <laughs> you don't want to give your opponent a land. Um, there's much better answers than Assassin's Trophy. But let's say you you take it to like Modern or Legacy or something like that, like. You know, some 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 return. Oh yeah. yeah, it's huge. There. Assassin's Trophy is an all star because uh, you not only are the games much uh, faster, but um, mana is usually not not like that much of an impact. It does not have that much of an impact uh, as standard, just because the uh, the games play a lot differently and like the the cards are much different. Uh, so. The power level of Assassin's Trophy is pretty high in a, a format like Modern or Legacy. Absolutely. Very interesting with your example of the uh, Assassin's Trophy, because typically I would think that a card that's powerful in Modern or powerful in Legacy is by default going to be powerful in Standard, if not overpowerful. We're always talking about you can never reprint most of these Modern or Legacy cards into Standard because they would just dominate but i guess that's not always the yeah, case like lightning bolt <laughs> right lightning I would, hey i'm i'm in that camp but that's just because i like casting lightning bolt i i don't care about the effects of it being too powerful i want to turn one red and and bolt my opponents i i, I just want to do that that's fun but yes that is a lot of fun uh how much does this criteria then is it changing or is it just a context change when we're examining so if someone's watching this now and they're like well i mostly play modern and we're using standard examples it sounds like we're you're still going to use the same overall criteria but that that context awareness is really critical uh yeah yeah it's, it's always been the same for me as long as i play magic the card evaluation evaluation has always been the same for me uh, you know, just that's one reason why you see me with so many wacky brews because I don't just dismiss every card. Um, right. I mean, obviously, some cards are not going to be as powerful as some of the, the most popular ones in the format, but uh, I feel like a lot of cards are dismissed because people aren't realizing the actual potential of the card. You know? Yeah. Um, or they're not maybe not using it using it in in the proper way. Maybe they're they're trying to you know. Uh, you know, put it out too quickly, or they're not using it at the right time. There's a lot of different things that, that could go into why a particular card is not seeing play. Until somebody, you know, somebody magically plays it in a, in a, in a player's tour, 
you know, or Mythic Championship, whatever the case may have been, and then top eights with it. And now everyone's like, oh, wow, that's actually good, you know? So back in Return of Ravnica days, I was playing Pack Rat, and everyone was like, why are you playing Pack Rat? That card is so bad. That card is so bad. And I would just beat everybody with Pack Rats. And, you know, I, it, it was crazy. I, I used to win FNMs with Pack Rat, and people thought I was bad because I wasn't playing the meta deck. I was playing my own Bruce. It, it was it was crazy because it was like not too long. I think it was like not even a month after I was winning these FNMs. Like somebody top eight a Pro Tour. They top eight with it, and then it went everywhere. It was everywhere. Of course, no one. Now all of a sudden, it's a broken <laughs> card. Then it's out of control. Broken. How did R and D let that one slip through from jank to broken? And no one would even give me even any credit on seeing the potential of that card. <laughs> Not a single right. person. And I was like, whatever. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, that's that's like one of those things uh, uh, I see like threads on Reddit where they'll go back and they'll find uh, uh, actual bulletin board posts from like when uh, uh, Tarmogoyf was a new card and people were discussing it. And they're like, oh, this card is terrible. This card is, is, is trash. Or even just more recently that nobody recognized that a card like Hogak was going to run out of control and, and things like that. So th that's always funny. That's definitely always funny. Okay, cool. So that's the basic methodology of evaluating. What about the opposite? What are the most common mistakes you see players make? Like mana cost is a thing. So like let's say you look at a, at a card and then it has a really good effect, but it's an activated ability and the card does mm -hmm. not have haste. Mm -hmm. You have to wait a whole turn before you can even use it. So like even if a card has a really good effect, you know, and it costs mana, you, you probably are better off using something else in its place. Um, mm -hmm. unless, that, unless that effect is really that powerful and you can actually protect your threat. Uh, so, okay, so uh, look at Brash Taunter, for example. I've seen a lot of people make a big deal out of that card. It's a new card from M21. Indestructible, you know, whenever it's dealt damage, it does that much damage to target opponent. But it has activability ability for two in red, and you tap it. Brash Taunter fights another target creature. Which, I mean, that seems cool, right? You know, your opponent has a Love Strike Beast out there. You fight, you deal five to the opponent. It's like, that's that's too expensive. Three mana to, to fight, and you're not even killing the Love Strike Beast. I mean, like, I can see where this could be good in, you know, different combos. But uh, you can't really you can't really uh, rely on that being a, uh, an effect that would actually help you win the game. So, I mean, if it was something that was immediate, let's say it had haste. Like, let's say your opponent has a... a you know, six six crisis on the board, and your opponent. You, you know, you just you, you just got your opponent down quite a bit. You you play it, it has haste. You can tap it without paying mana. Boom. You know, you kill your opponent on the spot, not even attacking them. That would be kind of strong, but it's nowhere near that. Not even close. So yeah, so you have to like you know avoid traps like that where something seems really good, but then you have to put a lot of work into doing it, and it doesn't actually even win you the game. Those are kind of like, like to go back to, I, I feel like these terms are now getting uh, uh, antiquated, but what you were just describing is when I first started learning uh, uh, to play, somebody would refer to that sort of thing as a Timmy trap, where there's a card and maybe on the surface there, you get very excited about the giant power level or you're, it, it's like when you see a planeswalker and you just read the ultimate uh, activation cost and you get so excited over what it can do and then you don't realize I will never be able to build up to that and have that actually happen or I will never be able to get 12 mana to, to cast this giant creature or any of those things and so uh, when I was first made aware of it they referred to it kind of as a, a Timmy trap uh, <laughs> uh, to watch out for though I, I, I've got a feeling I've got a feeling that that uh, uh, referring to things like like Timmy and Spike is becoming just antiquated in the current the current generation is is going to be like, wait, what's that? That's that's old talk. That's old <laughs> talk. <laughs> right. Like, um, yeah. Like, I mean, I, I can't I can't say that that I, I've looked at things like that before and was yeah. like, oh man, this seems really cool. I want to do this, you know. But then you need know, to use reel yourself back in. Like, you know what? Let's let's be real here. How, when is yeah. that going to happen? You know. Mm -hmm. um, uh, like that's why that's why whenever, whenever I look at planeswalkers. Like, I don't even pay attention to the ultimates on the Planeswalkers. Yeah. I just, I just look at the, the pluses and the minuses, like the, the ones that are not not the, the ones that you have to, like, minus everything just to, you know, mm -hmm. acti activate its, its ability. You know, but, mm -hmm. you know, because um, here, here's the thing. Opponents have, or should, or probably will have interaction. They, they right. probably have some kind of interaction, you know, they're going to have creatures to attack it. 
you know, it's not a solitaire game. It, you know, I mean, some people can make it that way, but <laughs> uh, right, uh, it's not a solitaire game. There's two people, and <laughs> it depends on if your opponent is going to do something about it. Which, I mean, you're not going to let your opponent ultimate the planeswalker, right? <laughs> right. That's so, that's the first. That's the first priority when a planeswalker resolves across from me is do not let them ultimate that. Yeah, so so that's, there's no point of even evaluating a card based off the ultimate. Now, if a card has a game winning ultimate to straight up win the game and it doesn't take long, like I say, it takes two turns to get to the you know right like two three turns, or you have some ways to get extra counters on it. Mm-hmm. Yes, then maybe then maybe it's practical. You know, like let's say you have a proliferate deck, and uh, the, the, this, this is actually a combo I, uh, I actually built a while back. Uh, when, yeah. Thero, when Thero's first released. So I actually had this deck that was based off of a, a combo of ultimating Liliana. And it had a Johnny the Great Hearted. It had uh, other proliferate creatures like a uh, Hotly's Raptor. So like it would self-mill, just, you know, mill a bunch of cards or, or over the course of the game, get them in the, into the graveyard. And you play Commanded Command Dread Horde. And you would revive Liliana plus, you know, let's say like, you know, two or three Raptors uh, with a uh, Johnny, and then you just instantly ultimate Liliana. So, <laughs> so you, you literally just you put it on the battlefield. Oh, good game! And then <laughs> your opponent just scoops. So something like that. Yes, you can reasonably ultimate a, a, a Planeswalker or like Nika Bolas, Draken got. I played that in the Grixis deck before rotation with uh, with Chandra, the uh, Acolyte of Flame. It, it actually ultimate Nika Bolas uh, usually by turn six. Uh, I would use Nicobolus effect to copy Chandra, put an extra counter, so uh, get two counters, and then Chandra put an extra counter on Nicobolus. And then next turn, Chandra put another counter, and then old Nicobolus. So, <laughs> so yeah, I would play Nicobolus and then ultimate them on turn on the next turn. Uh, it, it it actually worked surprisingly well because I uh, I would just you know, kill every opponents all your opponents cards and you know counter them and all that kind of stuff. So, but yeah, uh, if you're not doing something like that, you cannot ever look at an ultimate on the planeswalker. In a, in a realistic fashion, like, you can be like, oh, you know, maybe, maybe I can get it, you know, at some point. But don't ever think that you're actually going to get it, though. <laughs> uh, so what are some tips, maybe, that you would offer to people beyond just following the, the method you outlined when evaluating cards? Uh, some tips? Uh, yeah, look, look at, look at uh, the meta as a, as a whole when, when, yeah. when looking at... Uh, potential cards that you're going to be adding to your deck. What cards are going to be able to stop your card? Right. Like w- what what cards are being played? Like oh okay, it's a it's a uh, three mana costs or higher, and there's a lot of uh, Elspeth Conquers Death running around. Yeah, it's probably not a good idea unless it has a uh, immediate impact. If it's just a, 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 a you know three mana four mana, you know oh I hope I tap with this. It's probably, you know, <laughs> it's, it's probably not going to be playable in, in a meta full of ECDs or, uh, you know, Murderous Riders. You're going to want to have some kind of way to have value whenever you're playing your card. Let's say Niv Mizzet Reborn, for example. When that enters, boom, you, you, get, you get value. Or at least you're, you're very likely to get value. Even though it does not have haste, it's five colors, but you get tons of value potentially. So something like that is reasonable. Let, let's say it was a 6-6 flyer that did, you know, let's, let's say it, it, it had like, scry to and then draw one card that would not be very you know like i consider that i do nothing because you're spending your whole turn to scry to and draw a card essentially so like you have to look at it like that in those kind of terms like it's like do you really want to spend your turn doing this particular action that's what you have to look at like what what can the opponent do to get ahead if i were to do this what can my opponent do to get ahead and if, if it's if it's a lot of things you may have to reconsider your choice if there's not very many mm-hmm. things like, oh, okay, if I play this, okay, um, so I can actually get something out of it. So, like, let's say, um, you know, I play, I play a, uh, um, a Teferi Time Raveler, for example. I bounce a card, draw a card, and then if they answer it, if they kill it, you don't really care, right? You don't care because you already got value. You you, you time walk your opponent while drawing a card. Whereas, let's say you play a Nicobolus against, you know, you drop it against a ramp deck. And then you draw a card, your opponent exiles a card, and then they kill your Nicobolus. Like, you're probably going to lose the game at that point. <laughs> so, I mean, if you destroy a creature or planeswalker, 
that's fine. But if you're if you're if you're dropping it to draw a card and and your opponent exiles a card, they get to choose which one they exile, whether it's in the hand or on the field. That's very 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 low impact in my opinion. You, you got to look at cards like that. You got to look at whenever you're you're making a play, you got to make sure it's a play that's going to matter. Um, and if, if the card is not good enough to matter whenever you play it, it, it might not be good enough. Impact sure has become an all or nothing sort of uh, thing these days. Uh, we were just talking about in another episode the effect of the Cavaliers and just how outrageous having uh, impact both when they enter and leave the battlefield. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that even if, even if you get it removed, you're still going to have uh, uh, some impact there uh as well and definitely i think you're 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 right on the money with looking at just how much impact this card is going to have ask yourself the question if this card does get removed and that's what removal does it removes uh, what did i accomplish did i end up spending my spinning my wheels for a turn that's no good <laughs> right yeah so that's why yeah. uh, something like yeah. nissa is just so powerful because i mean you're, you're getting a creature out of it immediately and then you, you can access you can get mana from it immediately so it, it essentially costs three mana when you play it uh because you get two yeah. mana back most of the time uh but like uh let's say let's say for example cavalier gales uh instead of putting the cards back on top of your deck you put two cards at the bottom if you put mm -hmm. it at the bottom that card would be bonkers that card would be so playable uh mm -hmm. I, I think people would be you know going out of the way to play that card because you're drawing three, you're putting two at the bottom, so you put back whatever you don't want instead of putting it on top of your deck. Mm -hmm. uh, plus it's a 5-5 five, five flyer. So, like, I consider, like, little parts of an effect to be very important. You know, those little things you gotta look for. You know, like, uh, you know, scry one versus scry two. That's another huge deal. That's why uh, Omen of the Sea is so good. Because you're yeah. scrying two before you draw your card. It's not you just draw a card or you scry one and draw a card. You know, you get to see your next two cards. Like, okay, uh, these two cards are on top of my deck, which means I can do this and this and this. And then next turn, do that. Uh, so, okay, so I'll keep these two on top. You know, whereas if scry one is like, okay, I, I see this is on top. This, this may help me, but only if I draw this other card next turn. You know, so. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a. a Little things like that have a huge impact on the game, and I think a lot of people don't really realize that. Okay, so we just had a set drop, uh, uh, M21, really cool core set. I'm certainly really excited for it, enjoying it so far. Uh, are there some examples from M21 that you want to talk about with us in terms of how you might go about evaluating them or what your evaluation is so we can see it with, with brand new cards? It's, it's one thing to say, it's one thing to say I was ahead of the curve on Pack Rat, but let's, 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 let's hear your thoughts on what just dropped M21. Uh, okay, so, uh, one one thing that I would like to point out is uh, there's some really good cards, and then there's some cards that are kind of like you know hyped around, but it's not gonna really yeah. do, do so hot. Overhyped, you think overhyped? Yeah. Huh? Um, and then uh, th then there's a card that that could potentially be uh, like one of the best cards in the set. Oh wow! Yeah, okay. Um, well. You probably say save the best for last. Uh, <laughs> yeah, save the best for last. What What do you think is? Let's start with this. What do you think is overhyped? Overhyped, uh, Ren Siri. Uh, so it's a four four for four, which I mean, typically it's not very good, right? But the effects that it has has no, uh, no real impact on the game. So I see a lot of people getting excited about Ren Siri. It's like, oh man, you know, like you know, build dogs and cats. You know, I mean, maybe they just want to do it for fun, but you know. Yeah, that's what I think. They yeah. they just if that card was not an adorable dog and cat, if that card was like I don't know, like a goldfish or something that people or a snake or something, people wouldn't care. Yeah, but it's, it's a, a dog, dog and a cat, so, yeah, so they, they're to the moon for it. <laughs> they're to the moon for it. It's like, a dog um, and a cat. What are you not getting here? But, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but I do think that you know I think. You know, maybe people have gone a little bit too far, though, on it, you know? Um, yeah. Just, just a little bit, just a smidge. Yeah. Um, it, it doesn't do anything, uh, at least in my my, <laughs> my opinion. Like, um, Yeah. Now, in the long game, maybe, you know? But uh, but in standard, no. Like, I think in, in Brawl, Commander, 
I think the card can be fantastic, obviously. Uh, but yeah, as far as standard or any constructed format, I don't think it's going right. to be very, uh, very good. Just because it, it, the the way I look at it is, if you have to play other cards after you play this play that card, and it not even playable until no no earlier than turn three, I don't think it's going to be worth playing. I don't care how many dogs and cats you have ready to play from your hand, because uh, all it takes is a, a shadow of the sky and or extinction event. All it takes is one of those, and you, you're probably going to cry. Uh, <laughs> the fact that you get tokens when you play a card, they're only one one tokens, and then the activity ability is not going to have much impact. I just think it's, honestly, it's a dud of a card. I, I hate to say that. I'm sorry. I apologize to everyone, but it's just it's not very good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, what is a card you do think is good, then? Let's compare, then. Uh, uh, not your best card, but you said you had some cards you wanted to point out to us. What's one you do think um, is good? Like Heroic in about? Intervention. This card's going to lead to a lot of blowouts if people catch on. If people catch on, like you're playing it in, in, in a creature mirror match, for example, you know, your opponent swings out with their team. You know, let's say, you know, they got the Amber Cleave and you're like, like, oh man, you know, like, what, what are we going to do? You know, you set your blocks, they Amber Cleave you, you, you know, you, you're like, you're like, ha ha, I knew this was coming. Heroic Intervention. And then all your creatures are just like, like, what was that? Like, wait, did somebody just hit me with a, a cleave? I, I didn't feel that, you know? And then all of a sudden, it, the game goes from them going to win to now you're going to win. Just because your creatures gain Hexproof and Indestructible. Hexproof not, is not going to matter in this case, you know, if, if your opponent's already tapped out and Amber Cleaving you. But the fact that you can actually blow out your opponent that has a better board state than you is incredible with, you know, with that card. It can stop Shatters. It can stop, you know, Storm's Wrath. You know, it's a lot. There's a lot of things it can it can do. Um, uh, so it's it, it, yeah. it's 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 a card that I would say is it's it seems kind of like overpowered, but it, it's kind of like a balanced card that's just really good, in in my opinion. Yeah. So, so I think yes, yeah, so evaluating something like that, uh, you know, it, it's kind of hard to look at it and say, you know, like oh, how can this be bad? There are situations where it can be bad, you know, or your opponent has a Teferi on the board. So, so yes, there are downsides to the card, but I do think overall the card is really good. I mean, I'm glad that it's actually back in the format. Um, yeah. Do you um, remember? Was it? Uh, I I can't for the life of me right now remember because this is out of uh, Kaladesh originally. It's a reprint from Kaladesh. Was it? Was it uh, seeing a lot of standard play? Uh, uh, I believe so. Yeah. I know I it's big it in Commander, like it has a huge price tag because it's 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 huge in Commander, uh, which is what I think everyone's thinking of. But uh, uh, should definitely also uh, be pretty impactful in Standard as well. Yeah, I'm just waiting for everyone to catch on to it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you'll have to wait long on that one. I don't think you'll have to. I don't think that's. I, I don't think that one's as much as a sleeper. I don't know. I yeah, don't know. Yeah. I mean, I'm not sure if it's main board worthy, but at least a few slots in the sideboard. Yeah, sure. absolutely. What's another overhyped one you've got? Uh, another overhyped one? Uh, I would have to say uh, the fairy. Thank goodness. I know a lot of people are, are, are probably high on them, but I'm not too high on them. There's not many games where opponent resolved to Teferi and it was like, oh no, you know, like, or at least, well, it's Teferi 4. Um, Teferi 3 is far, far worse, in my opinion. I'm, I'm usually not happy about seeing that, but the Teferi 4, it's annoying, yes, and it does fuel uh, Euro, which which does suck, but there are ways around that. You could, you know, you scavenge and ooze and, uh, you know, other exile effects. There's not really any way around the Teferi 3, but yeah, Teferi 4, I feel like it doesn't do enough. Like it, it can phase a creature, but it doesn't actually it doesn't actually slow you down. So I feel like that card is kind of overhyped. I mean, it's a cool card. Don't get me wrong; it's a really cool card. I do think it's very strong, but it's not. I don't think it's as strong as people think that it is. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm glad because goodness knows I've had enough of uh, 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 overpowered to fairies to last a lifetime. Uh, so I'm glad that they 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 reined it in a little bit on this one. What is well, uh, yeah. I will note though that it's possible that after rotation, right, uh, it could become a whole lot better because uh, there are a lot of very very strong cards in the Ravnica block that are going to be rotating out. Yeah, so, it might just fill a hole. It might just fill a hole. Yeah, so so they just cross our fingers that that you know it's not going to take over. Yes, but as of right now, I don't think it's it's going to be very good. What's another one you think is good? Before we get to your best, do you have one more you want to talk about that you think is is strong, and then we can hear what you think is best? 
Uh, I, I, do, I think the, the new the new Garrick is is very, very, very strong. It, it may not seem like it's that good, which, I mean, in all fairness, the card is not really that, it's not really that good. It's not like, oh my goodness, I have to get four of these, you know, it's, you know, it's not like that. But in the decks that it, that you can slot them in, or you can even build around it, to be honest, it's, it's, it's actually good enough to build around. The fact that you can get creatures from the Planeswalker, three, three creatures on a four mana Planeswalker, that's insane. Like, it's, it, it's a minus, but you can do it twice before it dies. Maybe three times, depending on if your opponent has creatures or not. Because if your opponent has more creatures than you, after you get the token, you get to put a loyalty counter on it. And then all your creatures that you would that you would normally not want to uh, combat with, you can actually combat with. Uh, you can combat with Leafkin Druid. You can combat with Paradise Druid. Gilded Goose. You can even trample Death Touch with uh, Quaising Beast. You can give your love strike beast three three trample. So like you can curve in, you know, go from you know one one into like you know to, you know two drop into love strike beast into Garrick and just run your opponent over. Like it, it's 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 very very good. So I think Garrick Unleashed is is one of those cards that is borderline broken in my opinion. And then you said you also have a card. Is it uh, that you think it's the biggest uh, uh, sleeper of the set or just the overall biggest? Um. It, I think I think a lot of people are actually sleeping on it, and I think it should be played in more decks than what is being played in right now. Uh, I even think that uh, it could be worth playing in Teamer Wreck as well. Oh yeah, what what card? Uh, yeah, uh, it's Rada Heart of Killed. I love Rada. Go on, tell me why you love her. She's great. Okay, like this is actually probably the most broken card in the set, in my opinion. Yes. Uh. Okay, not only is she a gruel card that draws card, technically, but you get to see the top card of your deck. You get to see the top card of your deck. You know how important, like, how much impact that is? Like, oh, I know this is coming up. Okay, so you know what I'm going to do this turn? I'm going to do this. And it's like, oh, I, I know I don't have a spell coming up. So, uh, you know, I can use my, you know, I can use my Gilded Goose now, and then next turn... I'll just make a food with the goose, knowing that I'm not going to hit a land to play this other card in my hand. You know, or or let's say, let's say, you know, like you have a cycle land and you're like, um, I really, I really don't want to draw more lands. So I have a spell on top of my deck. Let me use my cycle to draw this spell. See if there's a land on top so I can put that on the, on the battlefield instead of playing my land drop from my hand. And then also potentially give your opponent like lesser, like uh, your, your opponent will have more to worry about thinking that, you know, you're like, oh, this person has four or five cards in their hand but then you're just playing lands off the top of your deck so you keep you keep a, a, a good amount of cards in your hand you know so they're playing around a whole bunch of stuff that you don't even have and then you know you just you're just getting you just getting free cards every single turn getting free cards and it even can combo with teferi time, master of time like if you go rada into a teferi master of time come on now like that's a, that's gonna that's gonna be very good being able to just you know hit cards off the top of your deck with rada and then filtering the, the lands ex, the excess lands that you have in your hand uh, that I think that's a recipe for for like some good combos right there. Um, it, it feels Euro, all that kind of stuff. So I do think Rada has more of a place in this format than a lot of people are are thinking at the moment. Yeah, they, they haven't thought about it at all. Uh, but even the activated ability, oh my goodness, the activated ability. So many games have been won. I, I've played around with this card, and. The activated ability is just ridiculous. Fantastic. It, it, yeah, it, it no, really it is. is. Like uh the, the the simple fact that you like let's say you go Nissa. You have Nissa on the board, you have a, a, a buttload of mana, and you you can activate Rada multiple times. Like let's say you have six lands on the board, seven lands on the board. You activate Rada twice, that's an extra yeah. fourteen power. Wow. Like out of nowhere, so it's 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 swinging seventeen at your opponent's face. Just so like you know, like uh, an interesting thing you could do. I mean, I'm not sure if you actually would do this in the same deck, but you can go activate um, Arata, play Storm's Wrath, wipe the board, swing in for a bunch a bunch of damage. Yep. So, uh, not sure if you would actually do that, but I mean, I mean, you could, you know. <laughs> Uh, so, I don't know, like, I think, uh, but, I mean, that's not even the, the main part of the, the card, but the main part of the card is just looking at the top curry deck, knowing the information, and being able to play lands off the top of your deck. Like, yeah. even if you're not playing a land off the top of your deck, just knowing that information, 
is just game breaking. Right. Like you, you know, like and your opponent, you're not revealing it, but your opponent doesn't know. But you know. That was something that I thought was really interesting when I first saw the card was that it isn't a, a lot of times when you see that effect, it's like play with the top card of your, your library revealed or something like this. But this is you just get mm. to peek. You get the information, yeah, which is huge, that your opponent doesn't know. You've got a, a, a dud sitting there or a, a really nice uh, spicy card sitting there. And then mm -hmm. you're not going to have uh, you're going to have significantly fewer dead draws uh, as a result of this, especially when you've got uh, other cards that let you play multiple lands per turn in the format. Oh yeah, like with Growth Spiral, like sure. you know, like let's say let's say you Azusa. don't have a land in your hand, right? And you're like, oh, let me Growth Spiral. Okay, let me. Okay, so I right, so I draw a card, draw, draw the non land off the top of my deck. Uh. Oh, there's a land on top of the deck. Oh, let me play that. Let me play this other land that I just yeah. revealed on top of my deck. Ugh. And oh, there's a spell. Cool. I got something good for next turn. Right. <laughs> yeah. No, it's a um, fantastic card. Yeah. Yeah. Like, um, oh, yeah. I uh, forgot to mention it has first strike. So <laughs> you can just swing in. And yeah. if your opponent blocks, you can just pump. So, like, beautiful. Yeah. It's, 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 it's an overall, like, it's an all star card. I, I think the card is very well des designed. It's not like, a broken card. It's only three toughness. It was four, if it was four toughness, I would say it's a bannable card, honestly. Uh, if it was four toughness. Uh, but at three, it's killable by a lot of things. It, it dies in combat to uh, like Questing Beast. So you, you have to pump in order to get past Questing Beast if you if you were to attack. Right. Uh, so, I mean, which isn't great. But I think they had to do it that way. If, it, if, they, if they made it four toughness, That'd Regardless of what much. the power is, I think the card would be this borderline, just, uh, just bannable. So yeah, yeah. But yeah, I, I think I think over overall the card is just really good. I think a lot of people are not giving enough credit. Yeah. Well, uh, we shall see. Only time shall tell. Uh, I'm sure that's one of the many cards from our discussion today. People can watch you play on stream. Uh, John, thank you so much for coming here. If people do want to watch you, and I'm putting all these links below, but if people do want to find you and the awesome uh, content that you put out, uh, where can they do so? Uh, you can uh, find me at uh, twitch.tv slash jrr 2 so uh, link in the description feel free to yep. drop a file there. And uh, I'm also on Twitter with uh, the handle JWR2 as well. And uh, I also have a Discord. Uh, you can find that through my Twitch and, and Twitter. So typically I try to stream in the evening, uh, usually between like um, like six and nine is usually when I'm on. Uh, but other than that, like I may have like a day stream if, uh, if I do not have my kids with me. So. Yeah. Well, John, thank you so much for being here. This was a lot of fun. And, oh, you know what? We were really focused on on standard. Didn't talk. We talked a little bit about modern, not too much. Can I pitch out a, a, a modern card and we just hear the evaluation that you might give for it real quick while I got you here? Oh, yeah, that, sure. Go ahead. All right. So what about just like something in modern? Uh, Lord of Atlantis. What What's the evaluation process on Lord of Atlantis? Lord of Atlantis. Um well, uh, I see. I see it's for Merfolk's. Um, so you, and you don't want to be playing Merfolk, so uh, I wouldn't play this card. Uh, cut! Cut his mic! Cut his mic! This is over. And so what you're saying is, is that the commander should take an already good card and make it better, right. rather than a card that is dead without the commander that will then be able to do something. Right, so there's a really good example. I play uh, Zedru the Greathearted mm -hmm. Commander. She's the donating goat lady. Right. Uh, I really enjoy it, and I get a bunch of people who will suggest cards that I should put in it that all have some big drawback, and the idea is that you'll give it away to somebody. Right. right? Uh, one of the ones that comes up a lot is Aggressive Mining, which is a card where you can't play lands and you can sack lands to draw cards is the basics of what it does, which sounds great because you can make it so someone never plays a land again. Cool stuff, right? Except if, say, I go to cast aggressive mining and they kill my Zedru, I'm now locked out of ever creating enough lands to pay the commander tax to cast my Zedru, and I'm stuck with this card forever and am basically dead in the water. See?